I am back with my friends Cyrus Vaughn in Spokane, Washington. Last time we visited Cyrus, he had the Clarisus Auditorium loudspeakers. In full disclosure, I want you to know that I am now a dealer for Clarisus Audio loudspeakers under the business name Audio Cafe. The last time I visited Cyrus, he had the CH Precision M10 and L10 components. Cyrus, what has changed now? Well, I made some changes in my application, mainly after talking to Roy Gregory, exchanged a few emails with him. He had done the review on the auditoriums, and he couldn't wait to do a review with, with the active crossover. And after a few emails with him, I decided to try the active crossover. Also, after reading the ton of reviews about Westminster Lab REI amplifiers, my guess is that they would really be phenomenal for these speakers. So I took a shot and went ahead and purchased three sets of the mono blocks. We installed them yesterday. The sound has been just like Roy thought it would it would be the sound is m much improved over what was already excellent sound from the CH. And this topology of six mono amplifiers for six drivers, three drivers per speaker, really follows what Florian Vigand of Clarisus Audio and Mike Bovert of Suncost Audio did in Florida at the Florida show, where I think they used um, six VAC amplifiers and uh, you saw Roy doing the same thing and you wanted to try it. That is exactly right. And I, and I think Roy's spot on. So far, I couldn't be happier. Where does your system go from here? What's next? Well, the only thing I really have left, I have a Tyco Olympus ordered, and it's probably a couple months out. And once I get that, uh, I'm done. Are we going to hold you to that? Or is there more audio toys to come? I think this is it, Ron. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks for having us again, Cyrus. You bet. Great to see you. Good. I'm with Angus Lung, founder and designer at Westminster Lab. Angus and I came up with Gary Leeds, a proprietor of Hear This, the distributor for Westminster Lab, to install Cyrus's six Westminster Lab REI amplifiers, a Quest preamp, a CS port ACN400 crossover, and a bunch of Westminster cables. Angus, great to see you again. Great to see you too. What do you hear as the improvement by going from, say, a stereo amplifier for two speakers to driving each individual driver in the loudspeaker with its own monaural amplifier? Well, first of all, you get rid of um, the passive crossover. That will actually improve the efficiency and it has less inertia within the circuitry. And of course, you get a uh, radiant separation between each drivers and they won't affect each other's during uh, operation. I think of passive crossovers as being kind of pure instruments in that you've only got discrete, it's an RCL circuit, resistor, capacitors, inductors. Why do you think the active crossover actually can achieve greater transparency than with simple passive components? Well, um, for example, uh, let's say the inductor, you have pretty much a couple of meters uh, or even dozens of meters inside it. Of course, it has a, a DC resistance, it eats up energy, and let's say for a capacitor, when the AC signal go past the capacitor, there will be a loss in energy when it changes polarity. So these things can be explained, uh, and, and especially at a high current, uh, large signal uh, environments like the passive crossover, it does make a big difference. Well, the absorption of power through the passive components makes sense to me, and it makes sense that that could retard slightly dynamics. But with regard to transparency, why does sending the signal through active circuitry improve transparency versus sending that signal through purely passive circuitry? I guess the transparency is um, an effect of minute details, I would say. Mm -hmm. So if there is a loss of energy within the passive crossover, these minute signals are lost mm -hmm. because it has been transferred as heat. So I think this is one of the reasons why. How big an impact do you think the Quest preamp provides here in this equation? Well, um, we run a quite a long XL cable from the Quest to the active crossover. So a good output impedance, like a very low output impedance like the Quest, will certainly be quite a good thing to have you know, in this setup. I watched you meticulously listen to different settings on the crossover. What was that process you underwent? How did you iteratively change positions on the crossover and improve the sound step by step? Well, I took... Um, Thanks for Clarice's website. I took their crossover's frequency that they uh, post on the website as a first reference. 
and because uh, we don't have an exact match uh, on the active crossover, so we have to do a bit of compromise. It's not much, I mean, a couple of um, hertz, and actually a couple of dozen of hertz, less than 100. But you know, you, you have to make a choice, you know, being a little bit high or a little bit low. And, and also, it's uh, in different environments, we have different um, acoustics and listening preference. It's just a trial and error, I would say. And as you target the sound you want by adjusting the crossover points and adjusting uh, attenuation levels, what reference, what are you using in your head to tell me, I'm getting closer to the sound I want, I'm getting further away from the sound I want? What is that reference in your head? There are two things, I would say. First of all, I would listen to the distortions uh, of, from the drivers. Because normally when the drivers get um, close to their breakup frequency, they tend to have a signature mm -hmm. of the distortion. So first you listen to that. And secondly, it's just um, take references of other speakers or setups, which you normally want to have and, and, and just take that reference. And of course, we need to ask our clients uh, preference as in what kind of sound he's looking for. And are you using the sound of live music in your memory as a reference as well? Yes, live and also recorded music from different eras. Because I always believe uh, there are certain types of signatures when we talk about uh, recorded music. So 60s have their own signatures, the 80s have their own signatures. So I think it's always important to have several musics from different eras as references. You have Apogee Divas yourself in the Westminster Lab office. How do you think the Clarissa sounds versus the Diva? I think the new magnets and also all these kind of technologies that they, that they integrated helps a lot. The efficiency is better, the speed is better, uh, the frame is much more sturdy. I think it's, it's, it's an improved design. I mean, think about it, the Apogee is like 30, 40 years ago. So it's great that some, someone is bringing uh, the ribbons back, I would say. What's new at Westminster Lab? What's the next new product we should expect from you guys? It's going to be something very exciting and it's going to be something which can be related to everybody. That's what I can disclose. A little cryptic? Okay. <laughs> Angus, great to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. As you lie.